for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Actually, many biblical characters lived in caves for periods of time. They're totally human. But most of the time when people say cavemen, what they're really saying, what they really mean, what the seculars are, are teaching is about the ape men. That these ape men are what they mean by cavemen. So what are the ape men and are they, is there any really good evidence from even the secular perspective for the ape men? What is the proof that's presented as proof for the ape men? And we're going to dive into that throughout this entire session. And as we do, guys, again, as the title suggests, we'll separate the fact from the fiction. What are the actual tangible facts? And what are, what are the fictional interpretations from a secular worldview that lead them astray, but they're propagated as actual tangible evidence? I'll we'll separate the fact from the fiction. And before we do that, though, let me answer a very popular question people ask all the time about the ape man. I understand why people ask, and it seems like a good question, but it's not actually rebutting what the evolutionists teach, and that is this. Many will say, okay, but hey, if human evolution is true, from a Christian perspective, even non-believers, if human evolution is true, then why don't we see ape men or ape women forming today? Isn't she lovely, right? So if evolution happened, if apes evolved into people over time, why aren't apes evolving into people today? And people say, since we don't see it happening today, that proves human evolution must be wrong. But guys, that's, here's the thing. The evolutionists don't teach that apes today evolved into humans. That's not what's actually taught within, within evolutionary teaching. What they teach is that all the primates, and we're lumped into the primates, they teach that all the primates evolved in parallel at the same time. So all the changing occurred in the unseen past, which is very convenient. And bottom line, they suggest, suggest this, that there's one common primate ancestor for all the primates living today, including us in secular thinking. And from that common primate ancestor, it branched off into many different branches that evolved at the same time to different things like apes, monkeys, gorillas, humans, etc. They evolved at the same time in secular thinking. And that's why we don't see apes today evolving into humans because that's a different branch altogether. And, that, and they all come from a common ape-like ancestor. But this also creates problems for the secularists. Because they believe this, that means they can't use apes today or apes in the fossil record as evidence for evolution. What they have to have then is some sort of half man, half ape, an ape man, something they would call a hominid, a human, a human ancestor. And that's why these ape men are so important, desperately so, to the evolutionists. And as it turns out, there are basically three distinct ways that the secularists today make an ape man. Here they are, in no particular order. They find ape bones, dress them up like a human, they upscale those ape bones and create an ape man. Or they find human bones, dress them up like an ape and downscale the man to an ape man. Or find ape bones and human bones, add some imagination, put them together and create an ape man. And each case is based on a wrong interpretation, based on a different worldview, and it's all based on a secular ideology. And so it's all based on how, what assumptions do you start with? Which foundation are you build your thinking from? Keep that in mind. So what is the track record in the past of these so-called eight men as good proof for evolution? Let's look at some of these very quickly. This is pretty entertaining and sad in different ways if you think about it. But some of the track records. Uh, Piltdown Man, discovered back in, or presented as proof back in 1912. The New York Times newspaper declared Darwin theory proved true. And in the, in the article they get through and say that it is proved true. Piltdown Man was used in the famous Goat's Monkey trial back in 1925 as proof for human evolution. That trial was a very famous trial that really put uh, Christianity on trial against evolution. And they proclaimed evolution as true at that particular point in different ways. What was Piltdown Man? Well, it was an ape-like jawbone, lower part of the jaw, and some sort of human skull cap. And these parts were discovered back in Piltdown, over in Piltdown, England, in 1908 and 1912, thus the name Piltdown Man. And these fragments were used as proof for evolution for 40 years. Now keep that in mind. Presented in textbooks and science journals and museums and etc. as proof for evolution for over 40 years. Claimed to be a 500,000 to 1 million year old intermediate link from apes to humans. What was Piltdown Man in reality? 
a deliberate fraud. Discovered so in 1953 after 40 years of indoctrination from a secular perspective. What were those pieces in reality? Well, we know the teeth and the jawbone were that of an orangutan that had been dead for roughly 50 years, clearly ape. The teeth had been filed down to look more humanoid, so like a transition from ape to human, so they're somewhere in between. They've been filed down to look like that. And then the skull cap and the jaw were stained the same color to look like they were old and they were related. They carbon dated the human skull to be roughly 500, 700 years old, even within their own secular assumptions. And really, Peltdown Man is one of the greatest hoaxes of all time in secular science. And discovered after 40 years of indoctrination, but not before teaching multiple generations that evolution must be true. And guys, think about it. If evolution is true, the Bible's clear history is false. And if the Bible's clear history is false, why trust it about morality or salvation? For multiple generations, this was undermining biblical authority, as it's still doing today in different ways, and these different so-called ape men. Another example what about Nebraska man? Discovered back in 1922, supposedly good evidence for human evolution, claimed to be a one million year old intermediate link. Also used in the Scopes Monkey Trial back in 1925. So, what evidence did they have to create Nebraska man and to make that drawing you see there before you? Well, first, let me tell you what they did not have. They did not have a skeleton, a skull, or even a jawbone. So what did they have to make this very elaborate, detailed drawing of Nebraska man and his wife? Well, these were scientifically built from a tooth. Yes, that's right, a single tooth to create that drawing. Guys, even Sherlock Holmes would be impressed by that sort of deductive reasoning power, right? That's some really, that's really just kind of using your imagination in a large degree. And so they kept researching, kept digging that particular area, found more bones connected to that tooth. It turns out that tooth did not belong to a man at all. That tooth belonged to a distinct variation of pig. There is the real Nebraska man right there. And as my friend Dr. Terry Mortensen says, this is the first time in history that a pig made a monkey of a man. It truly is. Or Ramapithecus. Discovered back in the 1930s, they found a very ape-like jawbone. And from this, they got this. Some sort of hominid, kind of transitioning uh, from ape to human, kind of walking semi-upright. And this was supposedly proof for evolution from that one jawbone. As this secularist said, secular scientist in Time Magazine back in 1977, they said Ramapithecus is ideally structured to be an ancestor of hominids. If he isn't, we don't have anything else that is. And that's kind of telling on the motivation. What was Ramapithecus in reality? Well, it claimed to be a 14 million year old intermediate link. But in truth, it was very similar to a baboon discovered back in Ethiopia back in 1970. Had a similar dental structure as that particular baboon and similar body structure as well. And then promptly it was dropped from the human line at that particular time. So... Just real quick, a summary of the facts thus far. Peltdown Man was a deliberate hoax. Nebraska Man was a pig. Ramapithecus was just just an ape. And in each case, the secular dates and the initial findings of all those remnants were wrong. They were off by more than 500,000 years in each case, sometimes close to a million years. That's a summary of the facts thus far. Give you a few other examples of the track record of the ape men in history. You got Boxgrove Man. Very detailed picture of Boxgrove Man and a relative there in the background as well. What did they have to draw Boxgrove Man? They had one shin bone. One shin bone to draw that. Again, it shows the power of people's worldview on this issue. Or Artipithecus rambidus cadaba. Say that three times really fast, all right? I dare you. But uh, uh, variations of the different Arpithecuses out there, but here's one of them presented as proof for evolution back in Time Magazine. Here was the evidence for Arpithecus rambidus cadaba, that whole mess of bones, very fragmented as they typically are. And, and they, they said from all those bones, all the bones were very ape-like besides one particular bone, one of the bones looked very human. Which bone was that? A single toe bone. 
That bone right there looked very human. But here's the thing about that bone. That bone, that toe bone, was found 11 miles away from the other pieces of the fossil that you're looking at in a different layer of dirt found 11 miles away. Actually, all the bones you're looking at right now were spread over nine miles. And so this has caused some to ask, was this the first suicide bomber, right? And was he wearing a nuclear bomb that spread those bones over nine miles? And guys, if you look throughout history, eight men have been deduced from things like alligator bones, horse bones, bear bones, elephant bones, donkey bones, even dolphin bones have been deduced to be eight men and then proven to be wrong. Why? Well, for lots of reasons. Number one, the worldview issue is the biggest issue. And then also lack of fossils to work with. We've got to realize that less than 1% of all fossils are vertebrate fossils. And only a fraction of that are land vertebrates. And guys, 95% of all land, of all land vertebrate fossils, they're one bone or less. One bone or less. So they're wide open to interpretation. As this secular scientist says, everybody knows fossils are fickle. Bones will sing any song you want to hear. And that is definitely, definitely true. I'll give you an example of this. Think about it like this. What if you found a piece of very ape-like jawbone? There it is right there. So a piece of ape jaw. And if you try to think, in, think to yourself as a, maybe a secular evolutionist, how do I interpret this piece of jawbone? It looks apish. Well, you could put that jaw, that piece of jawbone, Put it in a very rounded jawbone and give it small incisors and small canine teeth. Don't put large gaps between those teeth. And what you have there is some sort of in-between jawbone between apes and humans. It must belong to a hominid, an ancestor, therefore it belongs to a human evolutionary line. And that gets a lot of attention and, of course, helps support your research and support your ideology more importantly. But what if you applied that same jawbone and put it just in a regular ape jawbone that's very U-shaped with large canines, large incisors, gas between the canines and incisors? Well, if you have that, it's just nothing but a dead ape. Same little piece, two very different interpretations based on your starting assumptions, your worldview, and your motivations. A great example of this interpretational bias and how this plays such a big role is Lucy. You've probably heard of Lucy. We'll come back to Lucy in more detail here in a bit. But there are over 100 different depictions of Lucy from a secular perspective based on the interpretations of fragmentary evidence. You see these literally all over the world. We'll see some more later on. As this secular scientist says, few scientists produce such abundant returns from so few fragments as paleontology and the study of fossils. As this secular scientist says, again, secular scientists, the problem with a lot of anthropologists, those who study the human fossil record and study human history, that is that they want so much to find a hominid, a human ancestor, that any scrap of bone becomes a hominid bone. Again, ultimately, this is a worldview issue. We build our thinking from our foundation worldview. We're motivated by our worldview. And again, if you start with the wrong assumptions, as the secularists do, you will get the wrong conclusions. Bottom line is this. They're really trusting man's best guess about history over God's clear, revealed eyewitness account about history. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Keep that thought in mind. And so what is currently suggested as the best evidence for these eight men, this human evolution presented from the seculars? And I put the word currently in quotation marks. Why? Because this is always changing. If I updated this talk for every new piece of supposed uh, human evolution uh, proof presented in different papers, this talk would be five to ten hours long and keep getting longer. So I'll give you just kind of a basic framework of some of the generally currently things presented as proof for human evolution. And what I really want you to kind of focus in on, I want to really just expose the trends, expose the pattern that happens throughout history, how a piece of evidence is presented as proof for evolution, used for a while, and then typically later on, found out not to be related to humans at all, and then swept, and then swept underneath the rug. And so I want you really to see the pattern. I want, you, I want us to learn how to think critically and biblically as we look at these different evidences. And as new evidences are presented in the future, we can still think critically and biblically, remember these core principles. So here's the general flow of what's generally currently presented as proof for human evolution. You will see in the textbooks, in the zoos and museums, if you go to natural history museums around the world or read the textbooks or watch National Geographic, you have something basically like this. 
they'll be suggested there's a hominid day, which is the ancestor of all primates living today, according to secular thinking. Maybe lived roughly 30 to 40 to 50 million years ago. Estimates vary depending on who you're asking. And it's all basically guesswork right now from even the secular perspective. And then after the hominid day, they will suggest maybe there's some variation of the Ramapithecus, roughly around 14 million years ago with Ramapithecus. And then you got the Australopithecines on the scene, roughly two to three to four million years ago, depending on who you ask. And these numbers change a lot throughout history and currently as well. But that's the general trend. And those are really just distinct apes. If once you actually look at the actual data, we'll see that as we go through. And then from there, you jump to what are clearly humans. You get to the Homo erectus, which is humans, post-flood humans most likely. Then you get different variations of Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, modern man, Java man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll kind of go through each one of these, show the general trend and how the evidence is presented, manipulated, and then discarded over time. And uh, I want you to really grab hold of that trend and think about it biblically, critically. Also, by the way, did you know, before we kind of go any further, today, modern humans are typically called Homo sapien sapien. That's right, Homo sapien sapien. Why? Well, I'll give you a hint. Look at, the word, look at what the word sapien means. We'll come back to it at the end of the talk because I think it's, very, it's a key in, we'll, in understanding what's going on today and why it's happening today. But we're called Homo sapien sapien. We'll come back to that at the end. But what about the hominid day? What is the supposed evidence for this ancestor of all primates living today? Well, for a long time, the seculars thought that Eosimius was the ancestor of all primates living today. What was Eosimius? Well, it's a lemur-like monkey suggested to live roughly 30 to 40 million years ago. How did they know anything about Eosimius at all? Well, they found these two bones right here. Two jaw bones, the size of grains of rice. That's it for Eosimius. And from those two jaw bones, they concluded that Neosimius was shy, nocturnal, had large saucer-like eyes, and flitted about the treetops. Again, even Sherlock Holmes would be impressed by that sort of deduction or depressed, right? And this little critter right here seems shocked that we reached that conclusion. This guy's still around today, probably what they're looking at more or less in those bone fragments. Not an ancestor to all primates living today, just a variation of a tree-like, lemur-like monkey. So Eosimius was kind of swept under the rug more or less. And that's why back in 2009, Ida got such fanfare. Some of you might remember this. Ida was presented as proof of evolution, the missing link that we've been looking for all this time. When Ida was unveiled to the public back in 2009, Ida got a website. She got a book, a documentary series on the History Channel, all released at the same time to really push this teaching that Ida is the ancestor of us all. She was called, upon her unveiling to the public, the eighth wonder of the world, the holy grail of evolution, the Rosetta Stone, unveiling all these mysteries to us. And because they thought they'd found the missing link, even many evolutionists were willing to admit, evolution is finally confirmed. Finally. Hasn't been confirmed as of yet, but now this fossil, it confirms it. And by the way, you see this language all the time. It's repeated again and again and again. And even this secular says, there's no longer a missing link. What's implied there? <laughs> There was a missing link, but now we got it. So now we can feel free to declare there's not a missing link anymore. Ida was actually put on the Google logo when she was unveiled to the public. And guys, that is big time. When you're put on the Google logo, you've hit big time. So in 2009, she's called the eighth wonder of the world. 2010, Ida is declared a dead monkey. What happened? Well, they kept looking at the bones, and the more they looked at the bones, the more experts looked at the bones, they realized this is nothing but a monkey-like creature, a lemur-like creature. Nothing to do with being an ancestor to the primates living today, including us. What do we learn from Ida? Well, Ida is a lemur-like creature. Ida is a great fossil. She's very well preserved, which is, that's all the hallmarks of a rapid burial like during a flood, maybe even a global flood, as described in God's Word. And then also we learned that the evolutionists, they open up about what they're missing when they think they found what they're missing. You see that a lot. And then what happens is this. 
that Ida, after she was revealed to be nothing but a dead primate of some sort, some sort of dead lemur-like monkey, she swept underneath the rug with significantly less fanfare than what she was initially unveiled with. So they give her all this publicity about how she is the missing link. And then when she, found, when she is found not to be the missing link, they quietly sweep her under the rug. But still leaving the impression that this proves evolution to be true. And guys, this is the pattern. It truly is. You see again and again and again, unveiled to large fanfare and then swept underneath the rug, but still leaving the impression evolution must be true. And this is a great example of upscaling an ape fossil, as we talked about earlier. Nothing but an ape upscaled to be humanoid, a hominid. So that leads us to Ramapithecus. What was the initial finding for Ramapithecus? Well, this is what they had right here. From those pieces of jawbone for Ramapithecus, they went from that to that. There's Ramapithecus right there. That's a pretty big jump, right? Notice the whites around the eyes, that's distinctly human, and the eyes aren't preserved in the fossil record. That's artist reconstruction. And as we found more and better bones of Ramapithecus, we know that their skulls looked like this, the one in the middle. Very much like an orangutan, and that's all it was. Some sort of dead variation of orangutan or something along those lines. And evidently, these guys think it's hilarious that we think we're related to them or their ancestors. So, track record on this thus far for hominid today, no common ancestor. And for Ramapithecus, just an extinct or dead orangutan. And by the way, notice, please, there's supposedly millions of years of evolutionary, human evolutionary history with absolutely no tangible evidence for any of that evolution, just assumed to be true in evolutionary ideology, but presented as fact in textbooks, zoos, museums. And then to replace Ramapithecus, you got Artipithecus ramidus, which is already presented years ago as proof for evolution, supposedly a four million year old missing link. And I love what we read about as she was unveiled again, unveiled to a lot of uh, fanfare to the public as proof for evolution. What's the evidence for the pictures you're looking at right now for what they called Artie? Well, here's the evidence. That mishmash of fragmented bones, it took them 15 years to sort out all those bones. And I love this quote. Follow along with me on the quote. On discovery of Artie, she was found in very bad condition. These badly broken elements, such as the untrained eye, so if you're not trained in evolutionary ideology, you can't really understand these things, such as the untrained eye sees here, were interpreted by professional paleontologists, put in evolutionary paleontologists with a worldview. And with the aid of specialized, specialized computer software, which that software is made by a person with a worldview, with assumptions, and to a scientific opinion, secular ideology about Artie Skeleton, her bodily form, what she looked like, how she walked around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so doing all that based on their ideology, based on their worldview, they went from this to that to that. Fragmented evidence interpreted within a, world, within a worldview to get their conclusions. They had a whole Discovery Channel special released with the unveiling of Artie to the public. And they shared how they, they put her together. They took all the fragments, interpreted them with a secular evolutionary worldview to put it together the way they think she went together based on evolutionary thinking. And so they went from that, and then they completed the skeleton, made her walk upright, although the bones implied ape-like locomotion. And then they put, all, put on all the flesh, the bones, they filled in the gaps there, put on the muscles and the hair. And then they did this. They took a human, put motion sensors on the human, had the human walk around and climb and trace trees, and then put the flesh of Artie on the human with computer CGI to make Artie kind of walk like a human but look like an ape. And this was shown to millions of people around the world through the Discovery Channel. And it's very convincing. It looks really good. The CGI is really well done. But it's all based on an interpretation based on the secular worldview not on the actual fragments or bone fragments themselves. As this secular scientist says, by the way, is just some sort of extinct ape, probably orangutan or some variation of that, just an extinct ape. This secular scientist says, fossil evidence of human evolutionary history is fragmentary. It really is. And open to various interpretations. So, thus far, common ancestor, we don't know who it is, even in secular thinking. Uh, Ramapithecus, just an extinct variation of orangutan, same thing with Artie, some extinct 
or dead ape. Now, what about Australopithecines? The Australopithecines are maybe the most famous of the hominids of the ape men. There are different variations of the Australopithecines. Here's one. And if you notice the artist's reconstruction about uh, the Australopithecines here, notice how this one's looking into the future gazing out into the distance, contemplating the meaning of life, obviously. Standing upright, like a human, human posture, given human hands and the use of tools. And the most famous Australopithecines is this one, called Lucy. You've probably heard of Lucy, right? And Lucy, Australopithecines afarensis, supposedly one of the best evidences of human evolution or at least was taught that way for a very long time. Now, she's falling out of favor a bit, still presented as proof of evolution, but she was used for a very long time as the ultimate proof for evolution in human evolutionary thinking. So we're going to spend a little bit of time of just kind of debunking Lucy because of her special place in evolutionary history. So how did they find Lucy? Well, Donald Johansson went to Africa to find Lucy back in the 1970s. He went there with a grant to find a missing link. So notice his motivation. He went there to find something. He's looking for something in particular to confirm his starting assumption. And he found Lucy about two weeks before his grant money ran out, according to some sources. So it seems to make you wonder about the motivation there. But anyway, he found Lucy then, and her bones were discovered while they're listening to the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles. And that's how she got the name Lucy. Now they found around 25% of her total fossil. That's it. And she was claimed to be roughly 3.5 million year old intermediate link and claimed to walk upright like a human. But again, this is fragmentary evidence that's wide open to interpretation. So if you put those bones in more of an ape-like framework, like they seem to fit very well, Lucy had long arms and short legs like apes today. But you, you could also squeeze those arm bones together to make them shorter, spread the leg bones out to make the legs longer and to make her look more human, to make her a hominid and a human ancestor. And so same evidence, again, but two very different interpretations based on two very different worldviews. And guys, the second interpretation dominates the landscape of these bones. And she's presented as proof for human evolution all around the world, even at the angst of many secular scientists who disagree with the modern presentations of her. But this is how she's typically presented, like here at the St. Louis Zoo. She's walking upright. Notice her frame is very human, has an ape-like face, but other than that, very human, kind of hairy, but very human. Human short arms, human long legs, human-like feet, feet just like yours. Well, maybe yours aren't that hairy, but you get the idea. Same structure, human-like hands. And please bear in mind, they found no hand bones and no foot bones with the original Lucy fossil. None. But yet here's how her feet are displayed all the time like at the St. Louis Zoo and many other places or in the textbooks. Here's a drawing. Notice the feet are distinctly human in this drawing based on a secular interpretation. Now also realize we have found many bones belonging to the Australopithecines over the years. We found many foot bones and hand bones belonging to Lucy's relatives. And guys, they're distinctly ape-like. They had long curved fingers and locking wrists. They had very ape-like feet, toe goes out to the side, short ape-like legs, long ape-like arms, ape-like shoulders, ape-like skulls, ape-like everything. Yet she still presented very human in all the evidence we see in the zoos and museums, etc., etc. Dr. Charles Ochsenert, an expert in this field and definitely not a creationist, said her toes, Lucy's toes, stick out like that of a chimp, like a thumb out to the side. That's the way her foot was shaped, like apes. Yet she's still depicted like this all the time around the world. And guys, this is, not indoct- this is not education. It is indoctrination. They think it fits the basic ideology. So even though it goes against the known facts, it still fulfills the impression they want to give and the worldview they want to teach. Whether the St. Louis Zoo, the Chicago Field Museum, the London Natural History Museum, the Smithsonian, or in, uh, magazines, she's presented as very human-like with an ape-like face going against, again, all the actual known evidence. And supposedly the best evidence that Lucy was transitioning to be a human and walk upright was her knee bone. Dr. Johansson argued that the angle of the femur going into the tibia was angled in such a way that it was kind of in between the angles of humans and apes. You see, for apes, their leg bones tend to be very uh, vertical, just kind of straight up and down for the most part. Not a lot of angle there from the upper leg bone to the lower leg bone. Man, 
have a, we have a distinct angle in that that helps us do many cool things as humans in walking, jumping, skipping, dancing, etc. And then Lucy seemed to be kind of somewhere in between. And so he said, this proves she is transitioning. But guys, first of all, that knee that they found that was supposedly Lucy's is probably not her knee at all. It was found a year earlier, 70 meters lower in the dirt and over a mile away. So number one is probably not Lucy's knee. Number two, there are lots of monkey-like creatures today, apes today, that have different angles of the t- uh, femur going into the tibula. So the angle doesn't prove it's transitioning. Orangutans and spider monkeys have angles in their femurs as well. We see that today. Doesn't prove anything about Lucy transitioning. Even more important than her knee, though, is Lucy's hips. Lucy's hips are angled in such a way to be very much like that of a chimp and not like a human. You see the angle of human uh, hips and apes' hips are very different because we move differently. As this secular scientist says, an expert in this field, again, a secular scientist, I'll kind of just paraphrase a quote, her hips look that, like that of, of a chimp, very similar to that of a chimp's hips. The hips don't lie for Lucy, all right? And they see very closer in locomotion to how apes moved, not humans. So in other words, Lucy Walt kind of like a chimp. So most likely she walked on all fours, like chimps today. She probably waddled on two legs and went back to all fours, like chimps today. But guys, her original discoverers, they did not like that. And it did not fit their idea and their worldview about Lucy. So I want you to see what a team of scientists did. Only one is shown in the video to make the evidence of Lucy fit their preconceived ideas. And as you watch this, bear in mind, these are very smart people, but this clip shows really the power of your worldview, the power of your starting assumptions to dictate your conclusions. Check this out. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lakeshore. Uh, This has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they are in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. Okay, so just one quick interruption. Notice, the original ape-like perfect fit, it was an illusion. Why? It did not fit their starting assumptions about what they are looking at. So watch what they do to make it fit their worldview. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. You think, right? They grinded it down to look like they wanted it to look like. Again, it shows the power of their worldview. Again, brilliant people, especially in their particular fields, but wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And guys, even more and more today, even more secular scientists are agreeing about these facts we know about Lucy. For example, from this secular scientist, he says, regardless of the status of Lucy's knee, whatever you think about Lucy's knee, the new evidence we see today confirms that she walked like a knuckle walker. That's her basic body structure. 
She was an ape. She walked like an ape. And her skull was very ape-like. Here's, an, here's a skull of Australopithecine. Very ape-like. Here's another one. Very ape-like. And the experts agree, even from a secular perspective, very ape-like. Like this secular scientist says, the skull forms of all Australopithecines is extremely ape-like. And they have too many specialized ape-like characteristics to be either the direct ancestor of man or in the line that led to man. She's just an extinct variation of ape, most likely. But notice what happens all too often is this. You go from this, these fragments, and then you get an artist's reconstruction like this. Let's show her looking very apish in some ways, but humans in other. For example, look at the eyes. Notice the distinct whites around the eyes. That's a very human feature. The humans typically alone have a very distinct white around the eye. Apes' eyes are mostly black. It's hard to see any of the white except in the corners of their eyes. That's very human in presentation. Why did the artist do this? Here's what the artist said. I want to get a human soul into this ape-like face. That's not biased at all, is it? To indicate something about where she was headed. And where was she headed? Well, maybe to Walmart or today, nowhere. We're under the quarantine, right? But that's the idea. And so very quickly, in summary of the Australopithecines, had skulls like chimps, brain size of a chimp, ears like chimps, long arms like chimps, legs like a chimp, hips like a chimp, shoulders and back muscles and bones like a chimp, hands like a chimp, feet like a chimp. She was some sort of variation of ape or chimp, not a hominid. And even now, more and more secular scientists are saying, why is she still in this human evolutionary line? She should be gone and presented as some sort of ape or chimp, not a human. That's the secularist. And so what we know about the Australopithecines is that they are simply some sort of extinct variation of ape or chimp. That's the actual tangible evidence. And then what about Homo erectus, moving on from the apes now to the humans. By the way, Lucy is a great example of really upgrading a human fossil, or upgrading rather an ape fossil to be more hominid. What about the Homo erectus? Well, this is downscaling human fossils. Homo erectus was simply a human being who lived probably post-flood. Human like humans today. Human skeletons, human skulls, very human in the anatomy and in the DNA, as far as we can tell. Human skull size within the variation of modern humans today, on the low end, but still within the range of variation we see today in size and scale. Nothing distinct, distinctly ape-like about Homo erectus, actually all distinctly human for Homo erectus, 100% human. And what about the other Homo sapiens? We're running out of time, so we'll quickly do the Neanderthals and begin to wrap up, because Neanderthals are very popular they have been presented as evidence for evolution for a very long time. They were discovered back in the mid-1800s. They were originally constructed to look very ape-like. Their brain size was actually larger than ours on average, which is pretty interesting. But originally they were drawn and constructed to look like this and this and this, based on some uh, bones that seem to be affected by some sort of bone diseases and corrupted and bent and turned and so forth. We found more bones in Neanderthals, found out they're simply humans. They had skulls like ours with a thicker eyebrow ridge, that's true, but still within the variation of humans today. And their skulls were very stout, most, like, most likely very strong and hardy people, but 100% human. There's tons of variation in human skulls today. That's not weird. We see in their skeleton, it's strong, it's robust, but 100% human within the variation we see today. And now, for the most part, Neanderthals are presented like this, in zoos and museums around the world. Thank goodness science is catching up to the truth of God's word. And so they're humans. Actually, Aaron Trinkus, one of the leading experts of Neanderthals today, has this as what he presents, what Neanderthals looked like, again, just like a human being, because they were human beings living after the flood. Here are some of the pictures of modern understandings of Neanderthals today. Here's me at the Natural History Museum over in London, taking a picture with a Neanderthal. I'm laughing awkwardly because he needed a lot more clothes, but that's a different story. But Neanderthal is a great example of downscaling a human fossil. 100% human, but they're downscaling them to look more ape-like to fit their worldview. We know now from so many finds, we've gone for hours on this, Neanderthals made sophisticated tools and spears. We know they actually used makeup. They made and used makeup. 
Very human activity. They made thread. Talked about that on Answers News this past Monday. They made thread, very fine thread, to make either baskets or clothing or different things. They made needles. They wore jewelry. They hunted dolphins and seals. New evidence has shown they actually went into the ocean to hunt for some of these things. They made and sailed ships and boats around the area. They used fire to make food, to make glue. They built huts with animal skins. Animals don't do that. They did that because they are human. They made musical instruments like flutes from the femur bones of bears. They cared for their sick. They did surgery. The guys, they were human. They ceremonially buried their dead, and they, com- they possessed complex speech like modern humans. Why? Because they were humans. That's why. And then looking at the DNA, we realize in their DNA, there's no significant difference from Neanderthal DNA to our DNA today. And the variations we see in their DNA is less than some of the variations we see today in modern DNA of humans. They are human. No doubt about that at all from the DNA evidence. And secular scientists are catching up to this, slowly but surely. So I'm kind of putting all this together thus far. Again, you've seen from all this stuff, and we could cover so many others if time permitted, but either it's an upscaling of ape-like fragments to look more human-like, like with Lucy or different examples of that, or it's a downscaling of human fossils like Homo erectus or Neanderthals, or a wrong combination of human bones and ape bones like Piltdown Man and others to make an ape man. All based on partial fragmentary evidence based on a secular interpretation to get the conclusions they want to fit their worldview. And here's the thing, when you find enough of the bones, you know it's an ape. The bones are very clear. If you find enough of the bones, you know it's a human. It's only when you find the partial fragmentary evidence that's wide open to interpretation that you get these hominids, these ape men. And guys, what we see again and again and again in all of this is that real science, real genetics, real biology, real paleontology confirms the Bible again and again and again. You have no reason to fear what the secularists present as proof of evolution. We have good scientific evidence confirming the Bible. Stand on God's word. And real science rejects evolutionary ideology all the time. And people say, okay, Brian, but if it is so clear on all of this, then how come so many smart people today get it so wrong? Well, the answer is this. The Bible tells us. Because ultimately, this is not a head issue. Guys, it's a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue. And guys, your worldview, it tells you how to interpret what you're looking at to make it fit your preconceived ideas, as we saw with Lucy and her hips and many other examples. And I think this is really summed up well by what I mentioned to you earlier. What are humans called today? Humans are called today Homo sapien sapien. Why two sapiens? Well, the word sapien means wise. We are the wise, wise man. And I can't help but think of Romans chapter 1, verse 22, where it says this. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23 and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds, animals, and reptiles. And why do they do this in their sinful state? The verse before says this in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, that the ungodly, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why won't they listen? Revealing the unknown God. Now, we've covered a whole bunch of answers in many previous sessions. Yesterday, I talked about the evolving ape men. We've talked about dinosaurs, the age of the earth, and things like that. This session is an application about how do we use this in our culture to to be an effective witness to the world around us in a very secular culture like the one we live in today, revealing the unknown God. And really, it's getting to the heart of why won't they listen? Why do so many people today seem to Uh, have deaf ears when it comes to the gospel? How do we address them effectively from a biblical perspective? And so that's really what this session is all about. And a big part of our ministry is really about equipping Christians to be like the sons of Issachar, who had an understanding of their times in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Now, in context, the sons of Issachar, they understood it was time for David to be king. They understood what was going on and what needed to be done in response to what was happening in their particular culture. And guys, my question to us is, do we have an understanding of our times? What's going on, why it's happening, and what to do about it? Because I think we would all agree, it's pretty easy to see, that we're seeing the utter collapse of the Christian worldview in America and throughout the West. 
right? That's not hard to see. But the question is, from our perspective as Christians, why is this happening? And I think a better way to word that question is, why isn't the church, why aren't Christians influencing the culture like we used to, you know, years ago? Think back to Billy Graham's day. And guys, here's what we suggest. Because so often today, guys, it's the culture that's infiltrated and influenced the church. That in so many cases today, Christians have compromised God's word in different ways, in different areas. We've undermined biblical authority. As a result, we're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. That what has taken place and is taking place is an attack on God's word. Yes, outside the church, that's true but also inside the church. And the consequences have been catastrophic. And the fact that God's word is under attack, well, that's nothing new, right? It's been under attack since Genesis chapter 3, when the devil said to Eve, did God really say? And guys, notice what he was doing there. He was getting Eve to question God's word, to doubt God's word, so ultimately she would reject it. And that method was so effective He's used it ever since. Different forms, <clears throat> the same basic attack. And guys, one of the primary ways he is doing this today, right now, and for multiple generations now, is through the teaching of things like evolution and eight men and Big Bang and especially millions of years, using those ideas, those secular ideas, to get multiple generations to watch this, question God's word, doubt God's word, and reject it. Same basic attack with a different stealth twist. Notice what he's doing today. Today, he's attacking the Bible's history to undermine the Bible's authority, to undermine the gospel based in that authority. Because bottom line is this, to put it bluntly, if you cannot trust the clear history of the Bible, why on earth would you trust what it says about salvation? If you can't believe the earthly things of the Word of God, why trust it on the heavenly things? If you can't believe the beginning of this book, why trust the middle or the end? And for so many people today, especially younger generations, but not just them, this is their stumbling block to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guys, the people understand this best are the secularists. They understand this is a great way to attack God's Word by attacking it at the foundation, that history in the book of Genesis. I'll give you one example of this. I'll show you a quick clip of this guy. His name is Lawrence Krauss. He's a professor of physics over at Arizona State University. A clip back from 2009. <clears throat> I want you to hear what he says, hear the reaction of his students. And as you do, just bear in mind, this is a great example of how and where the attack is happening on biblical authority today. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Okay? And, and anyway... This is great. And you can determine for yourself which one is worse, the statements or the reaction of his students. But notice the basic sentiment that's conveyed throughout our culture today. Forget Jesus. Forget Jesus. He's not your Savior God. Why? He's not your Creator God. You're not here because God made you like the Bible says. You're here because stars exploded. Bottom line, he's basically saying this. The Bible's wrong about the beginning, it's also wrong in the middle and the end. This same guy said later on at a different conference that change is always one generation away. So he said, if we can plant the seeds of doubt in our children, and that sounds a whole lot like Genesis chapter 3, religion will go away in a generation or at least largely go away. And watch this. He says, this is what I think we have an obligation to do. Thank goodness he's neutral. 
No such thing, right? Either you're for Christ or against. Either you walk in light or you walk in darkness. There is no such thing as neutrality. But he is right about one thing. Change is always one generation away. We see it in God's word on numerous occasions. We see it happening right before our very eyes. According to numerous studies, now for multiple, multiple years, we're recognizing that around a, an average of around two-thirds of kids today who grew up in church and Christian homes go to church consistently. Two thirds of those kids, they're walking away from the church by the time they reach, by the time they graduate high school, by the time they reach college age. Two thirds of kids who grew up actively involved in church are walking away from the faith after high school, and that's been consistent now for multiple generations. That's a staggering number, and that's on the low end of the get, of the estimates. And according to research, one of the main reasons this is happening is because for so many today, they think you cannot trust the Bible in this quote-unquote scientific modern age. That it's been bombed out by these sort of secular ideas. And then guys, parents, grandparents, pastors, Sunday school teachers, here's the kicker. They're coming to us for answers. Hey, mom, dad, grandpa, pastor, Christian friend. If the Bible is true, well, then what about evolution? And what about the eight men we talked about yesterday? And what about dinosaurs and the Bible? And how do you know that marriage is one man and one woman? How do you know there are only two fundamental genders? And how do you, who did Cain marry? How do you have answers to all this? Give me some answers if the Bible is true. And you know, what has been our response as Christians in general to those sorts of questions now for multiple, multiple decades? It's been something along these lines. And guys, I said this for a long time myself until God got a hold of me on this. But we've been saying something like this. You know what? I don't know about the rock layers or the fossils or the eight men or those other issues, but don't worry about that stuff. Just trust in Jesus. And of course, hear me. We want them to trust in Jesus, no doubt about that. But also hear this. When we ignore their questions and we just say that, we're actually ignoring their fundamental question, which is this. Here's what they're really asking. Here's what the world's really asking. Why should I trust Jesus? In your Jesus. Because the message of salvation through Christ alone, that message comes from where? This book. And hey, Christian mom, dad, grandpa, pastor, if I can't believe this, if I cannot believe this part of the book over here, why should I trust the rest? Either all of this book is authoritative and true and trustworthy, or none of it is. Ultimately, this is a biblical authority issue. And guys, that's why this stuff matters so much. But because for so many generations, we've not answered questions, we've not equipped ourselves to stand on God's word, we've compromised God's word in different ways, we're seeing so many testimonies today like this young man's. ...of how I became an atheist. I was born into a Christian family and indoctrinated as, uh, growing up as a kid. That next year was freshman year of high school, and I started learning about evolution in my biology class. Then uh, that's where I realized I had never seriously questioned or thought about my religious beliefs. So as I learned about evolution and just started thinking philosophically about it, I realized that there couldn't be a God. So I became an atheist. And I'm willing to bet that most of you know someone with a very similar testimony as that young man's. Because this trend has been happening for a while. Actually, here's a poll published by Pew Research. Looking at the weekly church attendance of people by their generation. And in short, basically it says this. The younger the generation, the less they go to church. The older generations go to church more often weekly. The younger they get, the less they go. Down from 56 to 44 with a silent generation. The boomers down to 32. Gen X, my generation, down to 27%. And the millennials down to 18%. And guys, as the millennials become the dominant group in our culture, in our church, what does this tell us about where the church is headed? That's their mentality about church and the things of faith. They represent the coming generation of leadership in the church. We're following the trend of what's happening over in England, Canada, throughout Europe, where average weekly church attendance has dipped into single digits. We're following in that same trend. And for Generation Z... The news is even worse for them. These are your teens of today. Generation Z, they are twice as likely as any other previous generation to declare atheism as their worldview. George Barner recently said this about Generation Z. I'll just read the quote to you directly. They said this, It may come as no surprise that the influence of Christianity in the United States is waning. 
rates of church attendance, religious affiliation, belief in God, prayer and Bible reading have been dropping for decades. Decades. Americans' beliefs are becoming more post-Christian. Oh, that is so true. And concurrently, religious identity is changing. Enter Generation Z, born between 1999 and 2015. They are the, they are the first truly post-Christian generation. This shows the trend of our culture. We're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. 66 to 88% of young people are leaving the church never to return. Creation or evolution, which do you believe? Um, I'd probably have to say evolution. Evolution. Uh, evolution. Is there any powerful argument that makes you think evolution is true that causes that confusion? Um, I think the studies that have been done on uh, apes and monkeys are pretty compelling. I think that the you know, genetic sequence can change over time, over millions and billions of years. Uh, mostly fossil records and just databases of really just the fossil records. In your church background, were you ever exposed to any scientific evidence for creation by your church leaders, pastors, anything like that? Definitely not. Nothing in particular, no. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Do you uh, still attend church today or, or not anymore? Um, only for holidays. We kind of stopped going together as a family, but... You see, there's one worldview that every single person in this country has been exposed to. The idea that evolution is true and that the Bible's account of origins is nothing more than fairy stories. Did your church leaders, student leaders, bring in any creation teaching that showed you there was scientific evidence to support the Bible's account of creation? Uh, yes. Yeah, we learned a lot about different um, creationist scientists and the proof of young earth creationism. What are you studying now? Biology. Biology, right. Steeped in evolution. So, uh, but you're not convinced by the evolutionary arguments in your biology classes? No. Still attend church today? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, every Sunday. Would it be fair to say then that being able to discuss creation openly at church uh, has helped strengthen you in that area, prepare you uh, for what you've learned here at College About Evolution? Yes. We're becoming less Christian every day. How do we present the gospel in a secular culture like ours, where many today, they don't believe the gospel today. Why? They don't believe the book from which the gospel comes. How do we effectively engage them with the gospel? And how do we engage them with the gospel effectively in a culture where many today in our culture, they don't have the foundational biblical knowledge to rightly understand the gospel in biblical context for it even to make sense? How do we do that today? So with all that being said, we as a ministry like to suggest a radical idea for a powerful way to share the gospel in our culture today. We suggest a great way to share the gospel today in our very secular culture is to do it, it's a radical idea, the way God does it in the Bible, by starting at the beginning. something silly? Bears can't parallel park. <laughs> Do you hear something even sillier? Darwin thought that bears could turn into whales. Back in the 1800s when Darwin first published The Origin of Species, this is exactly what he said. And he was brutally mocked by scientists of his day for thinking something so ridiculous. He even retracted the idea from later editions of his book. But here's the kicker. Scientists of today think essentially the same thing. 
<laughs> Stupid Darwin thinks bears could have turned into whales. How ridiculous. Everyone knows these wolf, pig, weasel, hippo things. Or it turned into whales. <laughs> My, how the tables have turned. Back in the 80s and the 90s, a series of fossils were found that rocked the evolutionary landscape. Paleontologists thought that they had found a clear transitional series of fossils documenting the evolution of whales. University of Chicago evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne says in his book Why Evolution is True, whales happen to have an excellent fossil record, courtesy of their aquatic habits and robust, easily fossilized bones. This is one of our best examples of an evolutionary transition. Wow, one of the best. Let's take a look at the story behind whale evolution. Is it a good argument or not? So according to Coyne, whale evolution is such great evidence since we have a chronologically ordered series of fossils. And it goes something like this. The sequence begins with a raccoon-sized animal called Endohyus, living 48 million years ago. 52 million years ago, we see a wolf-sized creature called Pachycetus, which is a bit more whale-like than Endohyus. At 50 million years ago, there's the remarkable Ambulocetus. Rhodocetus, 47 million years ago, is even more aquatic. Finally, at 40 million years ago, we find the fossils of Basilosaurus and Dorodon before we have our modern whales. Let's take a look a little bit closer at this chronologically ordered series of fossils. If you're paying attention, you might be thinking something fishy is going on here, but no, you'd be wrong. That would not be a bad pun because whales are mammals, not fish. But also, yes, something mammally was going on here. Granting the standard Darwinian dates for these fossils, Endohyus is dated as far younger than his supposed descendants. And he's not the only one, more on that later. This is common practice in evolutionary analysis to ignore where species actually show up in the fossil record and place them wherever makes Darwinian sense. Creating what are called chronological inversions or ghost lineages. <gasps> oh, that's so spooky. The fossil record often reveals fossils out of the order that they're supposed to be in. For just a couple of other examples, let's take a look at bird evolution. It's supposed to go theropod dinosaurs evolving into birds, with the fossil Archaeopteryx being evidence of this as an intermediate fossil. But the problem is he appears long before the dinosaurs he was supposed to have descended from. Evolution also got a big stick in its spokes with this guy, Tiktaalik, a fish-like creature that was for years crowned as the smoking gun transitional fossil of fish starting to go from the sea to the land. Brilliant evidence, just what they expected. Until in 2010, fossil footprints of true tetrapods were found in Poland long before they were supposed to have evolved. And all of a sudden, Tiktaalik was dethroned as a transitional fossil because again, the dates are all out of order. Hey everybody, I'd like you to meet my grandpa. Oh, so cute. Is, is that his name or? No, his name is Seymour. He is my grandpa. What? Doesn't make any sense. Back to the chronologically ordered series of fossils, Basilosaurus and Dorodon are considered fully aquatic whales. They're not a transition to anything. Okay, maybe they're just trying to pad their numbers a little bit. Big deal. Surely the rest of the fossils are intermediate and transitional, right? Well, that depends on how you define intermediate. In paleontology, intermediate doesn't mean what we think it means. Like my parents are intermediate between me and my Gam Gam and Pop Pop. Oh, hello, sweetie. Hi, Gam Gam. Oh, my, how tall you've grown. Ah, but you're so skinny. Would you like your Gam Gam to make you a nice pot pie? You know, staying healthy. Is By intermediate, paleontologists usually mean a fossil is merely morphologically intermediate. In other words, if a fossil has features of a supposed ancestor and descendant, then it is classified as an intermediate or transitional fossil. But with that definition, I would be a morphological intermediate between this jockey and this professional basketball player. But that doesn't say anything about lineage, whether I'm an ancestor or descendant of either one. We could be completely unrelated, or even chronologically out of order, that wouldn't matter. The very thing they're trying to prove, the ancestral relationship, or how they came about, is pure assumption. This is how they can say there's tons of intermediate fossils and be technically correct, while at the same time skeptics can say, yeah, there aren't really any intermediate fossils, and also be correct. The fossil evidence is so meager that Darwinists, in order to prove evolutionary ancestry, they have to use a slippery definition that no one would accept in other areas of life. But for the sake of argument, let's ignore that problem because there's another one. Is there even enough time for the transition from land to water to hypothetically take place? 
Again, taking the standard evolutionary numbers for granted, we've got about 8 to 10 million years to go from the land mammal, Pachycetus, to fully aquatic whales. That sure seems like a whole lot of time. It's almost enough time for me to watch a Lord of the Rings marathon with someone who has a really small bladder. But is it enough time for whales to have evolved? The field of population genetics is devoted to calculating how long something like this would take. In the past, it was assumed that this was relatively simple to do, as easy as falling off a log. But more recently, scientists at Cornell University calculated how long it would take for different organisms to evolve two simple, beneficial mutations. For fruit flies, with their relatively large population sizes and speedy generation times, it'd only take a few million years for two mutations to become fixed. For larger mammals like humans, who have much smaller population sizes and longer generation times, they calculated it would take over 200 million years. Again, that's only for two beneficial mutations. Okay, so where would whales and their supposed ancestors fall on that timescale? They're not as quick to reproduce as flies, but quicker than humans. So for two simple beneficial mutations, that's supposed to take roughly 43.3 million years. So the evidence shows, using their own assumptions and calculations, that they don't even have one quarter of the time needed for even two simple mutations. And it takes quite a lot of changes to go from the land to the water, it turns out, including some of these lovely attributes. So, how many mutations does it take to change a pack of- Ooh, I know this joke. Three. One to hold it and two to turn the ladder. How many mutations does it take to change a pachycetus to a whale? Hmm, not where I would have gone with that joke, but what do I know? To put that in context, take giraffes and their derpy little short-necked pals, the okapi. They're quite similar, and a recent paper studied their differences and found surprisingly 70 different genes that likely contributed to the giraffe's appearance. If animals that similar required 70 gene changes for basically just a longer neck and stronger heart, it's a pretty safe bet that animals as different as Pachycetus and whales would require at least as many, and more likely many thousands more. But it gets worse. Recently a new bacillosaurid fossil was found in Antarctica that, even using the most generous dates for Darwinists, cuts down the time available for the whale transition to about half of the already not enough time of 8 million years, and could even place fully aquatic whales before Rhodocetus before Ambulocetus and contemporary with, or even before Pachycetus, destroying the entire fossil timeline. So is the whale transitional fossil series any good? Well, once you take into account the padding of their numbers, the chronological inversions, the ghost lineages, more recent fossil finds that discredit the timeline, and their creative use of definitions for what it even means to be a transitional fossil, the mathematical problems using their own numbers, they're all very clever tricks. But once you see how all of this works, it's quite a bit less impressive. To be fair, scientists aren't doing this maliciously. <laughs> they really believe that evolution is just obviously true. So they reason, whether we have 8 million years or 4 million years, lots of fossils or no fossils. If evolution is true and we have whales today, then they must have been able to evolve, regardless of any problems that pop up. But if you don't presuppose evolution, if you treat it as a hypothesis rather than an assumption, then problems like these become far more difficult to hand wave away. So these fossil finds certainly are interesting and worth debating, but there's a lot more to it than the uncritical, glossy, one-sided story being told. If this is one of the best evidences for evolution, what does that mean for their other evidence that's not as good? Hmm. You know what? I never noticed this, but my pet bat has the same number of fingers as my pet alligator. Isn't that a quinky dink? One of the main arguments Darwin used for his theory was that of homology, these odd similarities between very different animals. Why would they be so similar unless they were related? And this does make sense. After all, take siblings. They look pretty similar. They're closely related. Then take cousins or third uncles or former roommates or that weird guy down the street who's always going on about how he's a real human, but you're pretty sure he's just a stack of goblins in a trench coat. You can't fool me, I'm onto you.
Anywho, Darwin wasn't the first one to notice this, but he did harness it as a central proof in the origin of species. It's to this day used as great evidence for evolution, but is it really? Here's the story. Careful observers for a long time have noticed that very different creatures have very similar bits. These sorts of ideas date all the way back to Aristotle. If we fast forward to the 1800s, anatomist Sir Richard Owen coined a term for these observations, homology. Take a look at this guy. He's got an arm that starts with one bone, followed by two bones, and then lots of tiny bones for the wrist and fingers and whatnot. Great for grabbing stuff and high-fiving. Whales and dogs have basically the same structure, but they're not so good at those things. Why in the world would that be the case? Before Darwin, biologists chalked this up to common design. Just like a painter has a particular style and reuses similar colors or themes that he likes across a lot of his work, so the thinking went, similarities in animal design pointed to a common designer. A few years later, along comes Darwin, and he figured that these structural similarities were important evidence for his theory of evolution. So, rather than a common designer, he instead credited common ancestry. But which is the proper explanation for these obvious similarities? Enter biologist Tim Barra. Guys, 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 I've got a really good illustration. It'll totally put this question to bed. If you look at a 1953 Corvette and compare it to the latest model, only the most general resemblances are evident. But if you compare 53 and 54 side by side and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. The evidence is so solid and comprehensive that it can't be denied by reasonable people. In using this analogy, Dr. Barra actually demonstrates precisely the opposite of what he intended. Here's why. A succession of even very similar forms doesn't demand common descent. It could, in this case it does, instead point to a common designer. These guys, the engineers at Chevy. Intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want. Just like I use the same password, Fluffy Bunny 123 for everything I do online. So the question remains open, is homology due to common design or common descent? Because the argument was so central to Darwin's case, his followers eliminated the question by simply redefining the word from simple similarity to meaning similarity due to common ancestry. They baked Darwinism into the definition of the word. Homology now typically means similarity due to common ancestry. It's a clever way to end an argument if you can get away with it, but for anybody paying attention, it's a baldly circular one. Common ancestry because common ancestry. We got a flag on the play, circular reasoning, illegal use of logic, five-yard penalty, repeat the fourth grade. Oh come on, no serious biologist could possibly make that mistake. Nobody defines homology that way and then uses it as evidence for evolution. Come on, people couldn't possibly be that No. The circular argumentation is still regularly used in high school, even college level textbooks, and many a YouTube video. The surprising thing is that many otherwise very smart people didn't realize this. However, more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is. So what are the options in trying to solve this problem and escape the vicious circularity? Seeing their success at redefining homology, some try to redefine circular reasoning too. Huh. All right, let's, let's see here. Whoa, 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 it's not circular reasoning. Let's call it uh, reciprocal illumination. Fancying up a term doesn't really change the argument. Did you order a pizza? I told you I'm making meatloaf. Well, this isn't pizza. It's an elliptical caloric transmission device. Oh, okay. Gahool. Wait a second. Other attempts were made to escape the circularity, but they had to give up on homology as evidence. And instead, they looked to other lines of evidence for common ancestry, namely, DNA. Eyeballing bones was a bit subjective anyway, it's kind of like trying to guess what someone's thinking by looking at their face. <laughs> oh wow, I wonder why he looks so sad. You think somebody died? It's hit or miss. But if you could look deeper by, say, reading his diary, you'd be able to see what's going on with far more precision. Dear diary, today was all you can eat taco Tuesday and I forgot to wear my stretchy pants. I could only eat seven tacos and they forgot to add extra guac. This day couldn't get any worse. This is pretty much exactly what scientists do when sequencing DNA. They're able to move to the more objective realm of cold, hard numbers. If you look at different creatures' DNA, the rule of thumb is the more similar, the more closely related, and vice versa. Biologists expected to see a gradual branching path of DNA mutations from species to species, and they did find some success. Take, for instance, this little guy. He's a gene called cytochrome C. You can find a version of him in such places as your handsome or beautiful self, chimpanzees, dogs, moths, even yeast. He's one of the most commonly sequenced portions of DNA, so it's a great test case to see if the similarities hold up and point toward common ancestry. So, 
If we compare your cute little cytochrome C to this ugly, hairy chimpanzee cytochrome C, they look exactly alike. Weird. With dogs, there's about 90% similarity. Moths, about two thirds similar. And yeast, only about half similarity. Wow, just what we'd expect. These results must be really strong evidence of common ancestry. Whoa, no, who let you in here? Shoo, get out of here. Meet Cytochrome B. He's a lot like C, except he likes to throw monkey wrenches into Darwin's expectations. He's just one example of many. If Darwinism is true, we should be able to construct a reasonably consistent family tree, pretty much no matter what genes we compare. But that's far from the case. In reality, using genes like Cytochrome C as evidence for common ancestry is just a good example of molecular cherry picking. Depending on what genes are used, biologists will come up with wildly different ancestry and contradictory trees of life. Comparing different animals' cytochrome B genes, scientists found cats and whales cavorting in the primate club, kicking poor little cute little tarsiers out into the cold, frogs and birds and fish carrying on together in their own strange little group, and even sea urchins masquerading as chordates. It's madness! Molecular evidence, as it turns out, does very little to support homology. It's basically a big, wet blanket for the hopeful biologists who study the field. So homology can't be used as evidence for evolution because it assumes the very thing it's trying to prove. And when biologists try to fix it by pointing to DNA or other areas, it only further undermines the case. Now, to be fair, doing away with homology doesn't necessarily disprove Darwinism, but it is illustrative of the kind of lazy thinking that's common among many Darwinists. Bad arguments can simply get passed on uncritically. All homology proves is that scientists are just like everyone else, people, and we can be uncritical of things that we want to believe. But what about all the other lines of evidence? We've got biogeography, embryology, antibiotic resistance, whale evolution, even vestigial organs for crying out loud. Is this kind of lazy thinking when dealing with evidence for evolution a one-off mistake in biology, or is it more pervasive? That's a great question for another video. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.